Hi, thank you for streaming one of our latest messages here at Mountain Lake Church. We hope you enjoyed the message. Please come back again very, very soon. We know that life change stories happen. They happen every day. And at Mountain Lake Church, we want to hear about your life change story. If you'd like to share your story, please visit us at mountainlake.tv and click on the story button. You can also find service locations as well as times. And if you can't come to see us in person, please know that we stream our services every Sunday at 9, 10, 30, and noon. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. And we're starting a brand new series uh, today, and we'll finish it up on Christmas Eve uh, called Classic Christmas. And if you weren't here uh, two weeks ago, the Christmas Eve service times, just so you're aware, are 10, 12, 2, 4, and 6, 10, 12, 2, 4, and 6, and uh, we're talking about this idea of classic Christmas today, and we'll finish it up then, and here's where we're, this idea of classic Christmas, we're really discussing those classic feelings or emotions uh, that you hope to get uh, around Christmas, Uh, the feelings or emotions of joy, of peace, of hope. It's those emotions that you sing about in all the the famous songs. It's the emotions that you hope to get when either people come to your house or you go to their house. It's the emotions that you hope to get when you watch the Christmas movies. And you see that and you're going, yes, I'm looking for, I'm trying to find joy and hope and peace. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you are like me and you're like gigantic fans of Christmas movies? You're like, get fired up about it? Yes, okay. Um, we do that at our house, watch all the different Christmas movies, and one of our favorites that we watch with our kids are, is the uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. You know what I'm talking about? And the poor pathetic little tree right there. And how many of you, by show of hands, you grew up uh, watching uh, Charlie Brown and Peanuts in the Charlie Disc? Okay, we're probably over the age of 30. Great. Um, and, and, here, and you remember the teacher? And how she talked and what she said. You remember that? Yes, okay. So here's what I want to do. And some of you kind of did it already. Uh, I I want us uh, as a church to collectively do the teacher's voice. Now, if you're over 30, it's going to bring back warm childhood memories. If you're under 30, you're going to think this is the weirdest group of people you have ever been around. But but I want to make a point. So on the count of three, we'll say it together. One, two, three. Wah, 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 wah. Okay. (laughs) It's awesome. It's great. (laughs) Some of you are like, what kind of church is this? Anyway, I say you that because I think, at least for me, and I bet if you and I talk, Christmas season can feel a bit like that. You're going to want, 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 want. You're searching, you're looking, but it's the same thing over and over and over. And you got to shop, and you got to travel, and you got to buy, and you got to give, and you got to cook, and you got to do all these things. And you're searching for joy, and you're searching for hope, and you're searching for peace. But this Christmas season is like the last 10 Christmas season. It's just like wah, 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 wah. And you're just waiting for January 1st to get here so all this can be over and move on down the road. And so you're searching and you're looking, but it just becomes cluttered noise around Christmas. So you go, ah, I'll find it later. I'll look for it later. And if that's you, we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks, searching for joy and searching for peace and ultimately searching for hope this Christmas. But today we're going to start our search with with a little bit different, something that you must search for and find first before those other emotions fall into place. And we're going to look at the story of some men that by all accounts, very successful, They're wealthy, they were influential, they had power, they were brilliantly smart. And for for all accounts, if we looked at them, we'd go, man, they're successful. But the story that we find in their only piece in the New Testament is their story of searching. They had traveled by most scholars' accounts, many scholars' accounts, at least over a thousand miles searching for Emmanuel, God, with us. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew quotes Isaiah, and he says this, and quotes out of Isaiah, look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And I love that phrase because it's not God is over there, God is some distant being out there, God is for them, or God may be around here. So Emmanuel is God with us. 
And yes, this Christmas is about traveling and buying and shopping and all that stuff. But if you can just clear away the noise of Christmas for just a little bit and understand that it is about the celebration of Emmanuel, God coming to earth, God with us, it should make your search a little bit more clear. And these men, they're the wise men, the magi, were searching for the newborn king of the Jews. Now, if you've grown up in church, you know the story of the wise men. You know the story of the magi. Even if you're not a church person and you're here, you're kind of skeptical or cynical of preachers and churches anyway, but you're here maybe to keep the peace in the family. You're probably familiar with the wise men or the magi because you've gone to little kids Christmas plays. I mean, you've seen it, and you've seen Mary and Joseph, and that's the kids that can, that can speak in front of people. And then there's the, the shepherds, and they're usually the, the shorter kids. And then there's the wise men, they're usually the taller kids. And then the kids like me, they usually make sheep. You, know, you just kind of go over there and hang on the corner. So that's, that's the wise men. So it's the story of the wise men, the magi, in their search for Christ, their search for Emmanuel, God with us. Now, There are some thoughts about the wise men that you probably think that you need to know are not exactly in the scripture. First and foremost, um, everyone thinks that there were three wise men. You sing songs about it, and the reason we think there were three wise men because there were gifts, three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But as we're going to see in the scripture, we don't know how many there were. We know there were at least two because it's plural. But we don't know how many, everyone just assumes three because of the three gifts, but we don't know for sure that there were three. And if you'd ask me, Chris, how many wise men do you think there were? Uh, I think that there were four wise men. And you go, four of them? And I go, yeah. And you go, theologically, you got that? No, just sociology, I get that. And you go, how do you know that? Well, because I'm a guy. And I think when there were, were four wise men, because I think that there was that guy whose wife told him to bring a gift to baby Jesus and it's like, there are no gifts required here. So I think he showed up personally. It was like, oh man, she was right again. <laughs> Can the frankincense be from both of us? Can I put my name on that gift? And so I just imagined it was that guy. And hey, Jesus, these gifts are from all of us, okay? And so anyway, no, nothing scripturally backing that, just my own thoughts. Anyway, so we know that there are at least two, then there are plural. So these wise men, magi, come to see him. The other thing that we know is that they weren't there at the manger scene. They weren't there the instant Jesus was born. You're going to see that since they enter into a house, and scripture references a, a child, more, more the term of a toddler, than the baby. And so, you know, it wasn't like the shepherds showed up and then they left. And like 30 minutes later, the wise men walked. It wasn't like that. I was saying, okay, so... But if you've already got your nativity scene set up in the front yard, you don't have to move the wise men to the backyard. I said, well, kids, to be theologically correct, they were about a year later. So like four of you get that joke. Anyway, so we, we know that they came between about a year, maybe a year and a half later. So Jesus is a, is a child, not a newborn baby. But what we see, and the only time we see them in the New Testament is these men, they're, they're searching. They're looking, they're asking questions. And these were men that really didn't need anything, had all the money, had all the influence, had all the intellect, had all the the power, and they were successful in life that they needed, but yet they're searching. And again, by by many scholars' accounts, they'd walk probably over a thousand miles or rode camels over a thousand miles looking for the newborn baby, the newborn king of the Jews. And their story is picked up in Matthew chapter two. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it. And if not, it'll be on the screens. And their story is a story of searching. In chapter two, verse one, it starts. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, this is the only conversation, the only words recorded that we have of them. And the only words were just asking some questions. Where is this newborn king? We've seen his star. These men, they've studied stars. They knew stars. And so they saw the star. They roll into town asking some questions. And the only reason they came was not for a political move. 
It was not a power play. It was not a strategic alliance like many people would come to try to meet with a king. It was for one sole purpose, and it was to worship him. And look what happens. Verse 3, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? Now, one thing you need to know about King Herod is King Herod was a ruthless, bloodthirsty king. Brutal when you read the historical accounts of King Herod. He killed for jealousy, he killed for sport, he killed for fun. Killed family members and just had this extreme jealousy that anybody could come up and would take his place as king. He was placed there by the Roman Senate and so anybody that he thought might turn against him, he would kill wives, children, anybody he would kill for sport and entertainment. This is the type of king that's sitting there. And people knew this about him, and and many people think at this time he had become a madman, just so enraged with jealousy that he would kill anyone and everyone that tried to take the throne or that he thought was trying to take the throne. And here are these magi, these wise men walking into town asking about this new king. And so it not only disturbed King Herod, it disturbed everyone in the town because they knew what type of king he was. And all of a sudden, these men of influence and wealth come in asking about this new king. And so Herod calls all the religious people together and goes, well, where, where is this new king supposed to be born? Do you guys know about it? And they do, and they answer. Look at verse five. In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. The religious leaders knew where the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Now, don't miss this. Bethlehem is about five miles away from Jerusalem. Five miles. Not like it was 50, not like it was 500, not like it was on the other side of the world. Literally five miles away, they go, oh yeah, that's where he's supposed to be born. And then King Herod calls the wise men in. Look what happens in verse seven. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. And notice he doesn't use this 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 aggressive, ruthless tyrant of a king voice. He uses this cunning deception of his voice. Why don't you fellows go? You go there, you find him. Hey, you come tell me, then I can go and worship him too. And they go on their way. Look at verse nine. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And I think for me personally, this is one of the most fascinating accounts around the Christmas story. It's the story of these wise men, these magi that were wealthy, that were influential, that were brilliantly smart, but yet they are still searching. And some of you here today, you find yourself in a very similar seat. You're wealthy, you're influential, you're brilliantly smart but yet you're still skeptical and cynical, but you're searching. And if that is you in this room, hear me very, very carefully. If you are searching, that's you. If you are searching, don't quit. If you are searching and you're looking and you're asking questions, if you are searching, don't quit. And can you imagine what would happen if the wise men had stopped because of everything going on and they were just five miles away? They had travel over a thousand miles, gone through everything and gone, eh, you know what? This is becoming a bigger headache than I thought it would be. We're out. We're going back to our homeland. If you are searching, if you are looking, don't quit. And I want you to go back and I want you to look 
Just at verse three. It says, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. King Herod was disturbed, as was everyone in Jerusalem. And if you are that person that is searching, here's what I want you to hear and grasp is simply this. Don't allow others' reactions to keep you from searching. Don't allow others' reactions, how they react, how they respond, what they think, to keep you from searching. If you're here and you're skeptical and cynical, you're asking questions, you're looking, you're asking, you're talking, and you may be just one conversation away from finding what God is trying to show you. You may be one book recommendation away from finding what God is trying to show you. You may be one simple question away from finding what God is trying to show you, but reactions of others have an easy way of deterring our search. The crowd, they had no clue. They were clueless. King Herod, he was full of pride and arrogance and hate. The religious leaders were apathetic. The religious leaders knew And notice this, not a single person asked the wise men, hey, can we go with you? Like it's five miles away. It's not like it's a, you know, five day journey or 10 day journey. It's five miles away. Not a single person goes, hey, can we go with you just to see if the Messiah is there? Oh, we we don't know about that. Maybe it's other. You guys go. If you find something, let us know. And many of you, you are searching and other people's reactions are, are jaded toward you. They're, they're, they're skeptical of you. And so you allow that to go, well, if this is what it means to be searching, to be asking, I'm out. And if you're searching, and if you're looking, and if you're asking, keep asking, keep searching, keep looking where God is showing you. You, you may just be one conversation away from having that aha moment where God goes, this is what I've been trying to show you all along. And if you're looking for joy and if you're looking for hope and if you're looking for peace, don't stop just because you get a negative reaction. I don't know if you've ever like lost something and you ask people to help you look and they're, when they're helping you look for it, it's, they're less than a stellar reaction. About four or five weeks ago, it was a Saturday and it was a crazy Saturday. If you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about, where you're just going from one basketball game to another and trying to get lunch and everything in between. And we had driven back home in the SUV, and it was me, Brian, and all the kids. We had to run in. We had 30 minutes to grab lunch, get back to the SUV, and head to the, to the next game. And so we're there. We pull in. Brianna hops out with all the kids, and she's going in to make a really quick lunch. And I noticed the trash cans were out at the front of the street. So I get out. I'm going to, to get the trash cans, and I, I feel something. I was wearing a hoodie at the time, and something in my pocket fell out. And I, it didn't really dawn on me. I was like, whatever. And I got the trash cans and wheel it over to the side, walk into the house, and there's a little table where we put all the car keys. Reach into the pocket to throw the car keys there. Car keys aren't there. And all of a sudden, you're trying to replay where are the car keys, and it dawns on me where the car keys are at. Now, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Georgia has a lot of leaves. <laughs> Did y'all know that? I mean, I don't know. And, and our yard, you know, is about 90% of the Georgian leaves fall in our yard. And, and I looked out between the front porch and the, the end of the driveway, and there was the great abyss of leaves. And I dawned on me, my keys were somewhere in the middle of that. And you're try, as a dad, you try to be cool, calm, and collected and not freak out. But I was starting to freak out a little bit. And I go, hey, babe, I can't find the keys. And she's like, well, you know, we kind of need them. And she's making lunch. And I was like, you know, Daniel, I can't find the keys. I was like, well, dad, you know, it's, we need them. It's, it's the only key we had to that SUV. And you're going, well, why didn't you make an extra set? I meant to. I forgot. Get off me. All right. So <laughs> there's my only key. And so I'm looking around. I go, David, come help me. Uh, at this point, I'll take whoever will help me. He's like, yeah, I'll help you. So he walks out. Let me just show you how David looks for keys and leaves. He does one of these things. Hands in his pocket and does this. Now he's just like kicking over leaves. I'm like, dude, help me. He's like, I am, dad, I am. And so I'm scrounging, scrounging, and looking, 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 looking. And there are times like that where you're looking and nobody really seems to care. Nobody really seems to be like going, well, good for you, or, or can I help you find what you're looking for? And I can help you answer questions. You're just out there looking on your own. And it's easy to go, well, if this is the response that I get, I'm out. I'm stopped searching. I'll wait till next Christmas. 
And I was looking and looking and looking around and you're going, well, did you find the key? By the grace of God, yes. And it was one of those deals where you turn over this leaf and you see a, a shiny object and angels in heaven were singing and a light shone down and they're like, oh, we got it right there. But some of you, you may just be like one leaf away from turning over and God's going, this is it. This is what I want you to find. This is what I want you to see. But you, you don't turn over that last leaf. Why? Because of what they say or what they think. Don't allow others' expectations that they're going to place on you to stop you from searching and finding what God is trying to show you. I want you to go back down to the end. I want you to look at verse, start at verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, the wise men knew it would be a young child. That was not a real surprise to them. They came in asking about that. But common sense would tell them it would come from a line of royalty, probably would find the child in some type of palace, maybe a dad is a king, a mom is a queen. I mean, that would be the, the initial thought if you're talking about the newborn king of the Jews. And they walk in, and I can just imagine this scene. And I think it's easy to gloss over it, but you'd hear a knock at the door, Right, and Mary would open up, and all of a sudden there's these magi, these wise men. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there, and just very large figures, and there's Jesus, and they bow down to worship him. Now, they didn't find him in a palace. They didn't find a mom or dad who was the king or the queen, but they found Emmanuel, God, with us. And whatever they were expecting or, or thinking they would find, they didn't allow that to stop them from their search. They saw Jesus, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And what I want you to grasp this Christmas season is simply this. Don't allow your expectations to keep you from searching. Don't allow your expectations, what you expect or what you hope your Christmas to be like, to keep you from searching. You're looking, you're trying to find joy, you're trying to find hope, you're trying to find peace, you're trying to find all these things. But the expectations that you have and what you really experience, there's a monster gap. And you're going, you know what? It didn't happen again this year and I'm out. It was crazier again this year than it was last year. I'm out. I don't know if you're like me, but I find myself hoping for a Norman Rockwell family Christmas and wind up with something closer to a Griswold family Christmas. Right? Trees on fire and you know, you got your uncle dumping this RV into the sewage. You get all that crazy stuff. You're going, I wanted the perfect Christmas. I wanted everything great. I wanted everything nice and neat. And all of a sudden we're traveling, we're buying, we're doing this, we're shopping. And it's crazier this year than it was last year. And so what you expected and what you wanted to happen in your life, it didn't. And so you're going, well, January 1st will be here soon enough and I'll try to find it again next year. Don't allow your expectations of what you hope to find, of what you're hoping to experience and what you actually do, don't allow that gap to keep you from your search. Don't allow the things that you want to, you see it on the movies, you see it on the perfect cards, on the paintings going, I want that, but I'm really experiencing something far less than that. Don't allow that to keep you from your search. When you're searching for joy and you're searching for hope and you're searching for peace, Don't allow that gap to blur those lines. The things that you expect and what you want to happen and what you experience, monster gap, and that gap is usually filled with crazy, honestly. It's usually filled with busy and traveling and stress and arguments and all the frustrating things. You're going, I cannot wait for January 1st to get here. I'm one of the Norman Rockwell. I'm experiencing the Griswold family. If, If that's it, then I'm done. Keep searching. And I get it, I'm with you. Brian and I were talking about this yesterday. For whatever reason, like Christmas time, it, we've had some pretty stressful, crazy Christmases. Things that have happened are just going, man, we were glad January 1st rolled around. And we were thinking back nine years ago, and it was when Daniel was born, our oldest. And in that September, we had built and bought a house, moved into it. He was born in November. We had Thanksgiving at our house and then Christmas. And it was just, you've had, you know, seasons like that where you're just worn out. I mean, it's just crazy and chaos. And we were sitting there one night, a few weeks before Christmas and everything. And she's sitting there and Brianna's like, oh no. I was like, what? She goes, we forgot to take Christmas card pictures. And I was like, oh, babe, it's fine. You know, they know we love them. We'll get them to them next year. And she goes, no, we've got Daniel, the newborn. We've got to take Christmas card pictures. I was like, well, when do you want to do that? And she goes, right now. 
I was like, no, no, that's dumb. And she goes, no, we got to do it right now because I got to get them printed and mailed off the next day or so to be there. We got to do it right now. And I was like, no. And she goes, babe, we've got to do this right now. How many of you ever had an intense conversation with your spouse at Christmas by a show of hands? Okay, the rest of you are lying. I know that, all right? It's like three of us in here telling the truth. So we had this conversation and she goes, we got to do it right now. And I was like, fine. I don't know if you've ever like bartered with your wife. I was like, fine, fine. I'll do it, but I'm not taking off my PJ pants. I'll put on a nice button down, I'll tuck it in, you take the picture and crop it and we'll be fine. And she goes, fine, we'll just do that. And so she takes the picture, put it on the tripod, takes the picture, and then I don't think about it until a couple of weeks later, she shows me the Christmas card and my wife did a horrible job at editing the Christmas photo. <laughs> and I was like, this went to like everyone? We'd... She goes, yeah. And I was like, you look great, but it looks like you're married to a hobo. And she goes, yeah, kind of. Kind of does. And, and so I'll show you our Christmas card from about nine years ago. This went out to all of our friends and family. And uh, you see, I mean, she looks great. And Daniel's cute there. And the, the guy on the left, you, you see my pants. That's not a belt in that picture. <laughs> That's an elastic waistband of PJ pants. And it was just one of those Christmases. And, and, and maybe you've had Christmases like that where you're just going, it's so stressful. It's so chaotic. I'm just ready for January. And I'll search for all the stuff next year. And it sounds just like the teacher and the Charlie Brown Christmas. Wah, 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 wah. It's the same old, same old. I cannot wait for January to be here and we'll do it all next year. Don't allow your expectations of what you think your Christmas should be to keep you from searching. And if you are a follower of Jesus, my guess is you're looking for joy and you're looking for peace and you're looking for hope. All the classic things you sing about in the Christmas songs, but you're going, but I just, it just can't find, it just keeps getting blurrier and blurrier. I want you to go back and I want you to look just simply at verse 10. The wise man says, when they saw the star and the star had stopped over the house, it says they were filled with joy. But they weren't filled with joy until they knew this is the house where Jesus is at. They weren't joyful meeting with Herod. They weren't joyful walking into town. They weren't joyful. They were joyful when they saw this is the house where Jesus is at. And so you're going, I'm trying to find joy and I'm trying to find peace. I'm trying to find, trying to find all these emotions. And what you need to understand is that before the wise men, they saw all of that, the wise men, they searched and they found and they worshiped Emmanuel, God with us. They searched, they found, they worshiped. And only when they knew this is where Jesus was the joy and the emotions expressed. And this Christmas season, long before you search for joy and you search for peace and you search for hope, what you must start your search with is to search for Christ this Christmas. Search for Christ, Jesus, Emmanuel, this Christmas. Yes, you'll find joy and you'll find hope and you'll find peace, but Jesus is first. Jesus is, it really is what, and I get all the noise of Christmas. I understand that. But if for a minute you can push all of that aside and say, Jesus, I want to search for you. And I don't know what that looks like. You've got different family situations, travel situations than all of us. But there's that thing in your life and maybe it's on your ride into work and you're just going, Jesus, I want to search for you this Christmas. Or maybe when all the family is over, you take just five minutes and you go on your back porch where nobody is at and say, Jesus, I want to find you this Christmas. But there's something that you can do to clear away the noise, to clear away the clutter, the, the good things of Christmas, but they just begin to blur Emmanuel, God with us and say, Jesus, this Christmas, let me find you and you alone. And how many times do we allow all those things to flow into our lives and into our hearts? Now, what's interesting is the wise men, they met with two kings. And if their gifts were for a political play or for a strategic alliance, they would have been given them to King Herod. But notice, they had a conversation with the king of the land, but they bowed before the king of the earth. They had a conversation, they were interviewed, they were interrogated by King Herod, the king of the land, but they bowed, worshiped, gave gifts to the king of the earth, to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Hear me very carefully, this Christmas season, don't worship the wrong king. 
This Christmas, don't worship the wrong king. They were there. They saw two kings. They only worshiped one. I think it's all too easy to Christmas comes and we begin to worship the wrong king. And well, what, what type of kings do we worship? Here's a small list. We worship King Busy, King Shopping, King Travel, King In-Laws, King Perfection, King I Need the Perfect Gift, King I Gotta Cook the Perfect Meal, King Chaos, or King I Can't Wait Until It's Over and January is Here. And these are the kings we worship. It's gotta be perfect, it's gotta be right, it's gotta be this, it's gotta be that. The wise men only worship one king, they bent a knee before King Jesus. And this Christmas season, as you're planning and shopping and buying and traveling and all that stuff, don't allow those things to be the king in your life. Clear all that away and say, Jesus, I want to search for you. As I study, I read a bunch of different commentaries and one of my favorite commentary writers, his name is Warren Wearsby. And he's writing on this passage in, in Matthew chapter two and this line just struck me between the eyes this week. He said this. He said, no scholarly person who follows the light God gives him can miss worshiping at the feet of Jesus. No scholarly person who follows the light God gives him can miss worshiping at the feet of Jesus. And I'm fully aware that so many in this room, you're brilliantly smart, but you're skeptical and cynical more than anyone could imagine. You're brilliantly smart. And when you're smart and you're looking and you're searching and you allow God to work into your life, notice God used the star. These men knew the stars. God knows where you're at. He knows what you need to guide you and to get you where he wants you to be. The question is, will you begin the search? The question is, will you begin to search for Christ this Christmas or will you fold your arms and go, man, I cannot wait for January 1st. I cannot wait for all these Christmas sermons to be over with and we can get on back down the road. Don't allow your intellect, your brilliance, your cynicism, your skepticism to get, it, get in the way of your search for Jesus. I'll finish up with where my mind goes with this story back at verse 12. It says, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Now, here's where my mind goes for this, and this is whether it's just me or my imagination. My mind goes... And I would love to know what their conversation was like on the way back home. Would love to know that. You know, as they're driving back, you know, they had to replay all the, the crazy stuff they did, just experienced. Rolling into town and the chaos in the town, people not knowing what's going on. And they had to replay King Herod and they knew what type of king he would be and the, 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 the deception he tried. They probably had to laugh at the religious leaders who knew it was Bethlehem but wouldn't go five miles, but then they had to stop. He would think they would pause and go, that moment, that moment we walked in the door and we see Emmanuel. We're not just looking at a child, but we're looking into Emmanuel, God with us. That moment, it made it all worthwhile. It made the journey, it made the chaos, it made the interrogation by the king all worth it because we got to look at Emmanuel, God with us. And you would know that their lives would be forever changed not because of some political move, not because of some strategic alliance, because they got to worship the King Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, it is super easy to allow the craziness and busyness and just overall hecticness of Christmas to get into the way and to cloud our vision of you. And so, Lord, my prayer is that all of us would begin to search for Christ this Christmas. And whatever that looks like for us, as we travel, as we go, as we shop, and all those extracurricular things are fantastic. But, Lord, my prayer is that starting today, we would take a moment and just clear that away and say, Jesus, I want to find you this Christmas. And if you're here today and every head's bowed and eyes closed and you're that skeptical person, you're that cynical person. You're cynical of all things church. You're skeptical of preachers and Christians. Man, on behalf of preachers and churches and Christians, let me just say, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that you've been hurt, lied to, deceived, whatever it is, whatever baggage you come in here carrying. I am so sorry. But I just want to remind you that as Jesus grew up, 
and he began to call people around him. He said this, he said, follow me, not follow us or follow them. People weren't following a group of disciples, they were following Jesus. And so, yes, I'm fully aware that preachers or Christians or churches have, have hurt you and made you more cynical than you could ever imagine. But my hope today is that your search for Jesus ends now. That you say, you know what? I'm ready to find Jesus once and for all. I'm ready to place my faith in him. I haven't been to church in a really long time. But this Christmas, I want to find Jesus. Before you find joy, before you find hope, before you find peace, you must find Jesus. Jesus. If you're ready to place your faith in Jesus, you can say a very simple prayer, mean it from the depths of your heart. And today, you make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. You make him the king of your life. If you're ready to do that, just say something like this, but mean it from your heart. Just say something like, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And without you, I cannot get into heaven. So come into my heart. And be Lord of my life from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for everybody here in this room. Lord, my prayer is that this Christmas season, starting today, that we would begin to look for you and you alone. And yes, all the other enjoyment activities of Christmas are fantastic. But but Lord, my prayer is that we would stop and we would find Christ this Christmas. We would search for Christ this Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. We love you, Jesus. Ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.